Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Roger Hayes, uh, Chairman of the British Constitution Group. Um, if you haven't heard of our organization before, then essentially uh, we came together in about um, the middle of 2008, and the purpose was to do something about what was going on. And if you ask the question, um, have we made any progress? Um, the answer is we most certainly have. And um, I've been focusing on the courts. Um, I'm in the courts quite a bit. Uh, we're challenging the system. We're challenging the judges. And uh, what I can tell you is, first and foremost, when I walk in the, in the courts in Birkenhead, they all say, good morning, Mr. Hayes. <laughs> <laughs> and they all say... Um, they quite like it when we go in because it's always interesting for them. Um, the, the last case I was in was about two weeks ago. And as I walked in the court, the first thing is we don't get magistrates anymore, we get judges. And the first thing the judge said was, we said only one person in the court, right? They're actually having meetings before the court cases of which we're involved in to, to decide how to handle us, okay? The courts all over the country have been told how to deal with us, right? They're scared of us. And the reason they're scared of it is because we, under, we have uncovered what they're doing, okay? They are breaking the law in our courts. And I'll give you a couple of examples how things have progressed. But essentially what we've uncovered is simply this. That our common law courts have been taken away from us. And we have... We've got a, a system of administrative courts, but well, they're not even courts. It's a, a system of administration that's being forced upon us. And that means that when we go into courts, we are not able to actually defend ourselves using our, our, our court system, our, 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 our system of justice. And essentially what that's about is our constitution has been ripped up and thrown out. Okay? And that is the one thing that defends our freedoms and our liberties is our constitution. And we've got to fight for it, and we are fighting for it. Mm -hmm. and, and we are fighting so hard now that we are making an impact. As I say, that um, other, other uh, colleagues who are working in the system around the country, uh, we go into the courts, and as I say, that they have meetings beforehand, and what we have got feedback on is that the security of the courts are actually running the meetings beforehand and the reason the security in the courts are being involved is because they're scared that we're going to arrest another judge. Yeah? And we will, but we will bide, bide, bide our time. Okay? So we are pushing the agenda. We are driving them. They are not a drive, driving us at all. Okay? Now, um, last week, it's almost amusing because what their courts now realize is that um, we're not scared of them. They're scared of us. And what we are sending a message is slowly but surely we're catching them out. Eventually we will be putting judges in jail. And these, these people are corrupt. They're running this system for their benefit, not our benefit. And we know it. We've caught them out and we're progressing. Now when I walked into the judge, um, into the, the court, uh, the, the judge who was actually at the bench, I know him. He and I have sort of crossed swords before. And before I could open my mouth, he said, I want three police officers in this court with handcuffs. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, I've made an impact. I haven't even opened my mouth yet. Okay. And um, he wouldn't allow any of the observers in. So much, much for open courts, eh? It's incredible. So I said, why aren't I allowed my um, observers in here? Because we're supposed to be able to see that justice is done, right? Mm -hmm. They don't want people seeing what, that justice is being done because it's not being done, and that's the truth of the matter. Uh, this little episode with this particular judge, he then turned around to the council. This is another liability order. I think I'm in my fifth year now, so I'm a regular in the, in the courts. And look, the council officials shake. They're very scared. They're very nervous, and they, they, they're, they're intimidated because we're challenging everything they're doing. The council um, official was asked to give her reasons or, or read out her evidence and she, she prattled through a, 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 a bit of nonsense and then he turned around and he said to me, you tell me why you're not going to pay your council tax. Tell me now. And I just turned around and said, what's your name? He, he don't like me. He doesn't like me at all. And he said, they all know me here. I said, what's your name and how do you spell it? And he said, it's Abelson. And how do you spell it, sir? 
A B E L A B E L. It brings them down. It belittles them. It tells them we're not scared of them, and these are our courts, okay? And we are we will have our our laws back, okay? I then said to the judge, "Are you acting under your oath of office today?" And he said, "Of course I am." And I brought my warrant from the Queen. <laughs> Now, what made him bring his warrant for the Queen from the Queen? Because we've been asking these people, "Are you acting under your oaths of office?" They're talking about it all over the country. The magistrates, the judges, the courts are all talking about us because we have moved this thing through, and we are dynamic in what we're doing in the courts. I said, "That's excellent, sir. That means this is a common law court." And he said, "Yes, of course it is." I said, "Well, that's that's excellent. That means all the rules apply for for witnesses." He said, "Yes, of course it does." And do all the rules apply for evidence? He said, "Yes, of course it does." I said, "Do all the rules apply with regards to proof of contract?" He said, "Yes, of course it does." And I said, "In that case, I'll cross-examine the counsel's witness on the stand under oath now." And he said, "No, you can't." <laughs> At which point he said to the police, "Get him out of here." So the police moved on me. I said, "Gentlemen, I'll go of my own volition." So I packed up my bags, my books, and walked out of the court. And the police escorted me all the way through to the to the front of the court. And of course, I'm smiling because I anticipate this is exactly what's going to happen. We know what, the way it works. They don't want us in the courts finishing these court cases because they know we're right and they're wrong. Okay. When I got outside the courtroom, I said to the three police officers, three, not two, three. Um, what's your names? They wouldn't give me their names. So what are they scared of? I said, well, I'll take your numbers. So I took their numbers. We immediately went round to the pub, and we wrote up a document, and we drew up a summons to bring the judge back to the court to explain his action in the court. Right. So we actually laid a, a complaint about the judge.、Uh, the next thing we did, I wrote a letter to the chief constable, and I laid a complaint against the three. Constables who'd actually removed me from the court because they had taken me out of my own court hearing for no lawful reason. <coughs> so that's being that's ongoing business. So we're actually now starting to complain about the police. And what's going to happen is the police are going to are going to start saying, "That's a good question. Why did we take him out of the court?" Right? Because the police don't want complaints against against themselves. It goes on their records. So the next time the judge says, "Take him out of the court." The police should be saying, "What for?" So we are having an impact. So within the week, I was in front of a magistrate. In fact, the clerks to the justices,、um, explaining why the judge should be brought before the court and explain his actions because he was acting unlawfully. He had no lawful reason to exclude me from my court hearing. The reason he wanted me out of there because he knew I was right and they were wrong. And that's a good lesson to all of us. Okay, so they now know we're not scared of them. They now know that they, we've caught them out at what they're doing. So what we've got is a situation in this country where our, our, our common law courts have actually been removed, and we're fighting to get them back. All right. So so that's the situation with regards to the court thing. Now what I want to explain to you is actually what is happening with regards to the likes of council tax.、And、it's not just council tax.、Uh, we're uncovering. The procedures they're going through with a lot of other things as well, but the reason I'm going to concentrate on the on the council tax is because I've made it my particular thing to to get to the bottom of how this this whole business is is being orchestrated against us, how the system is working to oppress us, and I promise you this: we are being oppressed. It's subtle, it's slow, but it's definite. We are being oppressed. This is what should happen with council tax. If the council have a legitimate Um, claim against anybody who they feel should be paying council. I'm not going to talk about the legal fiction tonight, okay? Because obviously that's a different issue. How many people in this room have heard about the legal fiction? All right. So, had I asked that question three years ago, nobody would have put a hand up. So, so it proves the point that's getting out there. And I think it's also very important that it's not it's not circulating amongst the same people. It's spreading further afield. 
Um, so what we're doing, we're talking, and it is getting out there. And this is, this is an exponential curve. Um, you know, there's so many people know, and that curve goes up, and then it, it goes in a steep bank. I promise you, within 12 months, this thing is, is, it is global already, but it's, it's going to increase quite dramatically. Um, to give you an example, somebody handed me this um, before, which I'd not seen it earlier, but it's quite interesting. This is a, um, a report from, from Brussels, and it's um, the MEP Batten, who's the UK, uh, UKIP um, uh, MEP, and he was asked to make comment about the uh, riots in Egypt, and he, one of his comments is, all governments, even tyrannies, derive their power from the people. There's a parallel here with Britain, he added. Successive governments betrayed our people and surrendered rights to the EU. Under Magna Carta, the English have the right of lawful rebellion. Okay. Who's he got that from? Exactly. Okay. We are driving this forward. So that was an interesting point. All right. So what is actually happening vis-a-vis -vis, um, the... Council tax, how, are the government, how is the council going about collection and what are they doing wrong? What they're supposed to do, if they feel they've got a claim, the regulations require, the, this is the council tax um, administration and enforcement regulations of 1992, are quite clear that they must lay a complaint with the court. That requires that they go down and either, as I did, I went to the court and I laid my complaint. Now you can lay your complaint physically or verbally. Clearly in the case of the council it would be a, a, a written submission to the court. So they must lay a complaint. Having laid the complaint it should be viewed by a justice of the peace who would then decide whether there is a valid case to answer and the court would then issue a summons. That's the way it's supposed to work. The summons would then come out to the individual concerned and they would then turn up uh, at the court and actually either answer the charge or, or, or whatever. Um, what's actually happening is this. The council do not go to the court and lay a complaint. They don't bother. They simply issue a summons. Now the key point of course is that they, they themselves, the council, issue a summons. And what you'll find is they issue a summons on a piece of paper. In my case, the, the piece of paper reads the Wirral Magistrates Court, and it's signed at the bottom by Norman Draper, who is the clerk to the justices for the Merseyside region. That piece of paper is produced by the council. It is not produced by the court. That is fraud. They are committing fraud, and the courts know they're committing fraud. Now, what I have done is I've gone into the courts and I've said, could you please give me all the information with regards to the complaint that has been laid with regards to this summons? And the courts tell me there is no information. And I've said, well, there should be. And the clerks, not the clerks, the justice, but the legal advisors there have said, well, um, that's the way we do it now. Right? So what you have is for expediency, they are ignoring the regulations, they're ignoring acts of parliament, and they're just doing it their way. And this collusion between the council and the court is unlawful. When you go to a court, you're supposed to be in a place where you have a neutral judgment between you and the other party, the plaintiff and the, and the respondent, and yet here you've got the council and the courts colluding, right? So in the courts, we've then asked the question of the legal advisor. I've asked the question of legal advisors, is the court responsible for its own paperwork? And of course, the legal advisors know where, that, where that's going, and they don't, they're not inclined to answer. Okay? And we have, been, we have been catching them out. I've been in court and said to the magistrates, this piece of paper is a fraudulent document. You cannot pass any decisions based on a fraudulent document. They just ignore you, because they don't know what to do. Okay? So with regards to the um, documentation, both the um, laying of complaint is not being done, the summons is being fraudulently created by the councils, and then the judgments by the magistrates, despite them knowing, they knowing that the, that the documentation is fraud, they just 
if you like, stamp the, 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 the paperwork that the council issued them. Now, what's actually happening is that room that you're in is not a court. It is not a court of law. It's an administrative process. It's just a room. And, of course, um, if we've all discussed the legal fiction, we understand the process, that we're, 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 we're dealing with a, um, a claim against the legal fiction, not against the individual, the, the flesh and blood man, as it were. But moving on from that, what happens there and after? You will then get a letter from the council saying that they have got a liability order against you. Now, if there was a liability order um, officially created by the court, then it would be, it would be on the court record. Again, the regulation states that if a liability is order, a judgment or liability order is ordered by the court, it must go in the court record. So I have been down to the court, I have written to the court, and I have said to the court, would you please provide me all outstanding judgments in the name of Mr. Roger Hayes or Roger Hayes, etc. And they have written back and said, there are none. Okay? And the reason there are none is because it wasn't a court. Now, with a liability order, if it was a real liability order, the um, individual who has, um, has the order f for their benefit, if they want to then collect on it, remember, a liability order is, is an order by the court to pay the money. So if you don't pay a court order, that is contempt of court. And, of course, what they can do is they, they can then ratchet it up to the next level. So the next level is this, that if you don't pay that liability order, the court, on application by the council, would then issue a warrant of distress. And they would then issue a warrant of distress and give it to a court bailiff, who would then come knocking on your door. Of course, they don't do that either, do they? What they do is they pretend they've got a liability order, and they ring up the local bailiffs, and they actually use those as debt collectors. And they give them a little piece of paper, and the bailiff comes knocking on your door. When the, the bailiff knocks on my door, I tell him to go away, politely. Okay, there's no point being rude about this. Um, and they do go away. And, of course, the next process is that the, the, the council decide the process by which they, 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 they go forward next. Now, if this was all legitimate, they would go through, they could go through the process, um, the lawful process using the court system, etc., but they don't. They, th this is a private um, format they're using, and the whole thing is a scam from start to finish. Now, as most of you know, I'm sort of well prepared for all of this, and I decided to take it to the next level. Um, they decided they were going to bankrupt me or bankrupt the legal fiction. Of course, they, they can't bankrupt the man. They can't bankrupt the flesh and blood man because there's no contract. Suffice to say that the next thing, I allowed this to go through. I was actually busy on the day. I've had a letter from the official receiver, and the official receiver has said, you are bankrupt. And I wrote back and said, no, I'm not. <laughs> and he wrote back and said, yes, you are. And I said, no, I'm not. It's the legal fiction, Mr. Roger Hayes, that they bankrupt. Got nothing to do with me. And he wrote back and said, there is no such thing in fact or in law. So I wrote back with a copy of a dictionary with the definition of, lawful, of, of the legal fiction. Yeah? And I said... Yes, there is. You're wrong. I'm right. He said, get in here Friday at 9.30 so we cross-examine you. And I said, that's fine, but we're all equal in the eyes of the law. I will come in, I will have a tape recorder, and I have a witness. And I will ask you the following questions. And if you answer these questions, then I'll answer yours. And he phoned up and he cancelled the meeting. <laughs> He's taking it to the High Court. So I'm going to be in the High Court on the 28th of October. And that's going to be an interesting day, because I'm not scared of the courts, and I'm going to be asking the courts some very interesting questions. And the questions I'm going to be asking the court is, how is it that a judge can take a fraudulent document and determine that there is a liability order that doesn't exist, and to determine that a man or, or the legal fiction should be made bankrupt on lies and deceit in the courts? I would like them to explain that. Do you know what? They won't answer the question, will they? Do you know why? Because they know that we're right and they're wrong. So that's the process that we're up to now. Okay, we're challenging the courts. We've, undercovered, we've uncovered the fact that we have got a system of, of, of Roman law that's been introduced in the country. And our position is to spread the word, to tell people what's going on in the courts, 
And an interesting thing I believe that's happening is that the courts themselves are starting to say the people in, who work in the courts don't or haven't previously fully understood what's going on. And now that we're exposing them, they must be saying to themselves, well, why are we doing it this way? Why don't we do it the right way? Okay, so there's a very good question. If they're able to do it the right way, why don't they do it the right way? What's going on here? Well, I'll tell you what I think is going on here. When they supposedly have the liability order, right, it's not in the book, but when you're paying the money to the council, there's no record through the courts. Do you know what I think is going on? I think we've got money laundering going on here. I think they're stealing our money. Okay? And so we're going to be investigating this key point and finding out where the money's going. And I'll tell you what, they're going to get more and more concerned because every time we scratch a bit, we find something out. It's funny, you know, my instincts, every time I've had an instinct for something, I've got so close to the reality, that's when they start getting nervous and we actually start to uncover more and more. I would like to make a bet here and now that we're going to uncover the fact that these people are thieves and they're stealing our money, right? And we're going to get them and we're going to put them in prison, okay? And we're going to chase the judges and we're going to chase the, the, the chief constables. All of this team that are pressing us, we're going to chase them until we get our, our day in court, okay? All right, moving on from that, how many people in this room have heard about the lawful bank? Okay. The lawful bank dot com. Okay. The problem that we all are suffering from is greedy bankers. Yeah. We have a banking system that is basically just a casino banking system. And as a direct consequence of it, we are being pushed onto a treadmill to pay taxes, ever more increasing taxes and fines and penalty fines and so on and so forth, because they need more money. And what's happening is the more and more people who are getting on the greedy treadmill, the more and more money they need from us to feed them. Okay? And, and that's the issue at the moment. We know the system's going to collapse. We don't know exactly when, but we know it's getting near. Um, and obviously, we, we, we sort of give advice to people as, as far as, as what they can do to, to ease their situation. Um, people have mentioned, make sure you've got spare food in the house, that sort of thing. But I don't want to focus on that. What I want to explain to you is that the solution to the problem is our own monetary system. And the lawful bank is the start towards that. Um, what is a monetary system? Okay, it's, if we take this room as a community, and if we assume that we have all the resources that we need to live our lives normally, food, petrol, etc. Um, the money would just be a, a tool to allow us to exchange those resources. It is of no value whatsoever. Yeah? That's the basic format for, for money, is to allow us to exchange our resources. So if we create our own monetary system, the one thing that we need to make our monetary system work are the resources. So in order to find the resources, we need a critical mass of people. And what we're doing with the Lawful Bank is we're ask, asking people to sign up to the Lawful Bank so we can start building our numbers. And when we have sufficient numbers, we can literally just create our own monetary system. It, it really is as simple as that. It, in, in all the things that we are doing, the one thing I keep saying to people is all we need is the numbers. It's numbers, numbers, numbers. So the ongoing situation with the lawful bank is this. At some point in the future, we'll be able to actually launch our bank. And this is the way it will work. If you bring £100 into our bank, we will actually, using the fractional reserve system, give you £1,000 worth of credit. Okay? Now, we will take the £100 of their money and we will retire it. And we will create our own currency. And we're hoping to be able to use that currency in our local retailers. And if the local retailer says, is this worth anything? We say, yes, it is. We can actually exchange that for one of theirs. So we'll build confidence in our currency. And on the back of that confidence, we'll, be, we'll build uh, confidence in our system. Okay? The, the reason we're using fractional reserve banking is because any system of currency, in order to, to, um, to work, it needs liquidity. So you bring £100 in, we will create £1,000 worth of credit, and that puts positive liquidity into the system. Now, can you do that? That's what they do. Okay? 
the difference between what we will be doing versus what they do, when they create the liquidity out of um, using fractional reserve banking, they take control of the money and they lend it out. And that's where their wealth is being created on the back of interest. What we do is we give it to you. Okay? So we will actually create the liquidity and that will be yours to use. Now, what's the point of liquidity if you can't spend it? And that's the key point, isn't it? The secret is to be able to spend that liquidity. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up escrow accounts for the gas companies, the electricity companies, the water companies, and the council tax. Yeah? So when you get your council tax bill or your electricity bill or your water bill or your gas bill, you'll be able to pay those through the escrow account and settle that bill. And when they say to you, well, you haven't paid your bill, you can say, well, yes, I have. Here's my bank statement says so. And they're going to say, well, hang on a minute. That money's just been created out of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and, we're, and we're going to say, and we are going to say to them, guess what? So is yours. Now, what effectively we are doing is we are actually going to be taking back control of a resource. My belief is that Gas, water, electricity are essentials, right? We should not be paying profits to foreign corporations for essentials. Our government should be providing that because we need it. It's an essential part of our, 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 our lifestyle, our requirements, okay? So I believe that the people will get behind the concept of us taking back control of our natural resources, yeah? So that's the process that we're, we're looking at in terms of developing the, the, um, the, the reserve Sorry, the fractional reserve system. Okay, so um, in terms of businesses, mortgages, we'll be able to provide mortgages interest-free. Um, we'll be able to, to provide loans to businesses interest-free. We'll be able to provide loans for cars and, and essentials interest-free. Now, when you borrow money to buy an asset, you have to pay it back. The problem with the system that we have at the moment is they've lent it out willy-nilly without um, securities, proper securities, and it's also the interest. Effectively, um, the system itself is, is, is a constantly increasing monetary system, a constant supply of, of money because of the interest. Our system wouldn't encourage that. So we're able to provide that, that mechanism. Now, if we're looking at um, the idea that we've paid all of our um, bills to the electricity company, etc., we're inviting them to use our system as opposed to the other system. And if they turn around and say, well, how are we going to spend the money? We will say, well, actually, you can use the money to pay your employees. So you can actually use our money. And why would your employees want to use the money or our system? And the answer is because we can provide them with mortgages interest-free. And there is no good reason why you shouldn't use our system versus their system, because our system, it benefits the people, whereas the other system benefits the greedy bankers. Now, can you imagine the word going round about our new system, our new banking system, and the benefits that it's giving to the people? And can you imagine what politicians are going to be saying when, when the people start saying, what do you believe you should be doing? Do you think you should be supporting the people system or the banking system? What do you think the politicians are going to be saying? Well, we know who they're working for, don't we? But what about the next elections? The, the, the dynamics of, of the whole situation are going to be quite interesting. So we need to spread the message about the lawful bank. We need to get the numbers signed up. And at some point in time, we'll have enough people to be able to launch our own banking system. And I can promise you they're going to be very, very nervous about that. Now, the actual mechanism of the banking system itself is quite straightforward in so much as local communities can set up their own branches. The local branches will have their own representative. We'll have a committee of 100. And the committee of 100 will actually make recommendations um, and they will pass the recommendations down to the members who will vote on it. So we'll have a constitution. The committee of 100 will hire and fire the people who will actually run the system, and the people who run the system will run it in accordance to the Constitution. So it's not top-down, it's bottom-up. So it's a people's bank controlled by the people for the people. And that might sound a bit glib, but I think it's a pretty realistic scenario. 
in the beginning, Abraham Lincoln, President Kennedy, I won't go into details, they were all shot, they were all killed because they tried to assert the bankers' cartel. It's been nice knowing you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question. It, it's a very important point. So let me cover the key points. First and foremost, you've asked about you know, the safety of any individual setting up a new bank account. The, the lawful bank, I have got nothing to do with the lawful bank. Okay? It's being organized by other people. Um, there are other similar banking things being set up now. So you can, you can shoot me in the head. It's got nothing to do with me. Okay. And the other thing, of course, is because it's each individual branch is, will be operated by half a dozen people. Half a dozen people can set up their own branch. Um, they, they could have 100 members or they could have 500 members, whatever. We're anticipating thousands of branches all over the UK. And each one of those branches is owned locally, it's autonomous, and it can't be controlled by the, you know, the, 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 the organization, as it were. So it's controlled locally. So they've got a problem because they have to deal with every single individual branch. And anybody can open a branch subject to the, to, to the security criteria. Okay? So, so as one fails or, or, or succeeds on its own merits, another one will start. So, so you've got a constantly changing network of... of, of uh, of, of branches, okay? Now, as far as the electricity companies, and they turn around and say, well, we'll cut off the electricity. I want you to imagine this scenario. We're talking about a minimum numbers. We're talking about a critical mass. When you've got a million people who have decided to actually pay the electricity through an escrow account, and if you've got a million people who've got their own peace officers, because we are talking alternative governance, we are setting up our own courts, we're setting up our own peace officers, we're setting up our own bailiffs, okay? If they come knocking on our door, if the bailiffs come knock, knocking on our door, we will, we will meet them and greet them and we'll say, listen, listen guys, go away because we don't recognize your authority. Now that's already happening. I, what's happening now with the bailiffs is they're, they're walking away. They won't knock on my door. And I'm not using violence. With, we, we will not use violence. We use the logic of what we, we're doing, which is the rule of law, to impose upon them the facts that they have no right these foreign companies have no rights to our resources. Now, you know, the, the logic of bailiffs, they've got gas spills, they've got mortgages. I believe that we can, make, we can impress upon them that what we're doing is for everyone's benefit. Okay? We're also prepared to defend anyone in the courts if the, if the electricity company want to... And remember, they've got to take it to court. They can't just switch your gas or electricity off. And by the way, it's against your human rights as well. We will, we will defend, we'll have our own system of, of defense. Um, lawyers will call them what you will to, de to defend. But the other key point about it is we will see them in, in the courts, but we will see them in our courts, common law courts, right? Because we know that the system of courts they've got in place at the moment are not lawful. So we challenge them at every angle, okay? But remember, this is about numbers. And there's a million people all doing the same thing. We will close their system down. Why wouldn't they use our system with all the benefits entailed? Again, the logic is that they potentially will do so. All right, well, I, I think that sort of covers most of the, the general gist of, of what the lawful bank is all about. Are there any questions about either the court situation or the lawful bank concept? Sorry, I didn't really understand the concept of an escrow account. All right, well, what, what an escrow account is, is that once you've paid the money out of your account, it goes into a, an escrow account. It's available for the, that company to use, subject to the terms and conditions that you attach to it. Right? And what we would do is we'd, we would simply say that they, those, those companies can use that money simply just by signing up to the system. It's available to them. What we can say is that you no longer have the money. You can legitimize um, your, your claim that you've paid it because you have a documentation that proves you paid that money. And we can actually confirm it because our banking system will say, well, that's actually right. The money is available in this account for you. Yeah. Steve, go. Uh, isn't, um, isn't there some kind of similarity between the local bank and, well, yeah. to me, when you, when you spoke about there is a definite similarity to credit unions. Yeah. Yeah. The difference credit unions do not use fractional reserve banking. The benefit of fractional reserve banking with no interest and with secure loans is it pumps positive liquidity into the system. So our system would have positive liquidity and their system would, have, would be a debt-based system. 
And you, you've got to imagine this, that people are going to say, well, hang on a minute, what, 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 what did you say that if I take £100 from that bank and put it into your bank, you're going to give me £1,000 worth of credit? What's going to happen? So if you take your £100 and you put it into your bank, your new bank, and you pay your gas, electricity, your water, and, and, and your council tax, what are you going to do when you get another £100? Where are you going to put it? And bearing in mind that we're able, able to provide you with loans for cars, mortgages, interest-free, people are going to say, well, this sounds to be a pretty good system here. And the first thing people are going to say is, hang on, how does that work? Why don't they do it? And we're going to say it's because they're greedy. And that bank system is for the bankers. This bank system is for the people. So the argument is going to be, people are going to start talking about it because they're going to, they're going to start asking the question, well, if, if, if that system is, is ripping us off, why aren't our politicians supporting this system? And we'll say, because the politicians aren't working for you, they're working for the bankers. So the whole thing starts to unravel for them. And I, I promise you, even now they're starting to, 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 to backtrack. On, on, you, you, that's why you've got people in the, in, the, in the parliament all of a sudden starting to talk about positive money, alternative monetary system. This hasn't started out of nothing. We are pushing this agenda. It's because we've been telling them about the corrupt banks that people have started to, to, to come up with the supposedly owned solutions. And it's funny, isn't it? We've been talking about this for two years now. And I, I don't recall any member of parliament ringing us and saying, can we help? All of a sudden, you get this very impressive organization that starts to talk about a positive monetary system. And you've always got a couple of MPs hanging on in there, haven't you? Right? Gatekeepers. Are they interested in changing the monetary system? No, they're not. They're just gatekeepers to, 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 to promote a system that's not going to work. If those MPs had any, any idea that they wanted to, to make a, a positive impact, they would be talking to us. That's why we know that they're not genuine. Okay? You, you look at this, this whole child business, which, which Brian has done a superb job for the last several years. How many MPs ringing up to see if they can help? Zero. And, in, and we talked about Holly Gregg and we talked about these other cases that Brian's involved in. Where are the MPs, right? 650 MPs, you've, you've, you've got one who's supposedly, they're, they're representing the, 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 the parents who've lost their children. It's, it's, a, share, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a disgrace, okay? Sir? Roger, every time I click onto the computer, every time I put the television on, and every time I look at the paper, the whole world is corrupt. Yeah. You and I are the, probably the only two honest people on this planet. <laughs> <laughs> so, how am I? I'm going to deposit a hundred pound in your bank. Yeah. How can I trust you with that? Okay. <laughs> okay. The 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 money itself is retired. It's not spent. It's not lent out. It's actually retired. Where it goes, I'm not going to tell you for security reasons. Okay. But what, what we can assure you is we can guarantee its safety and we can confirm its safety. Um, we have a little technique where that money goes, which if I actually told you here and now, uh, you'd think it was absolutely genius, and it is genius, and it's part of the strategy. And we will have a committee of people who, who will understand the mechanism. But the process that we're going through is we will slowly but surely take control of their money supply. Okay, that's all I need to tell you. So we'll have um, branches all over the country. The branches will take responsibility for the, the deposits initially. We already have a, um, a, a system in place. We already have terminals available to us. We already have cards. So I can actually put a terminal in my house. I can put a terminal in your house. And I can transfer money from my bank account to your bank account. That's available already. You, as a local branch, could therefore give cash to your customers and I could give cash to my customers, and your customers could send money to my customers, and we could, we could provide the cash. So we can source it. Now, the money that's, that's retired, for uh, cash flow, for people who want to get cash flow, they will go to a local retailer who have a terminal. And so we'll be rely on the floats of local retailers. The local retailers will earn a pound for every deposit. So if you go in and you deposit 20 pounds, they will be paid a, a pound fee. If you deposit £100, it would be a pound fee or £1,000. So the retailers will be earning money. The, the retailers will probably earn about £50 a week for offering the services. We're relying on their float 
to, for the cash to go in and out. Okay? So the retailers are initially responsible for the cash on deposits and providing the, the, the actual uh, um, cash payouts. Um, the local branches will oversee the retailers and then the actual money, the, the, the large chunks of money, won't be in one particular place. They'll, they'll, they'll be distributed at different locations. Okay? Um, so that's, that's as much as I can tell you about the money, but it will be safe. But there's another important point, is we retire their money and we bring our own money out. Yeah, and I think I mentioned that before, so we're actually releasing our own. But you said earlier on that my money is not going to gain any interest. Oh, okay. If you deposit money in our bank account, you can lend that money to other members, and they, and, and they will pay you interest. But the bank does not earn interest. The bank will earn a fee. So if I, if, if I have a branch and I facilitate a loan to you, either, either, either the credit to buy something or cash from somewhere else, for example, if I'm going to get a mortgage, the fee is 10%. So I've got to come up with £10,000 of cash. Yeah, real cash. I call it real cash from their system. And you, you would then, if you, were, if you were borrowing that money, if, you, if you're borrowing 100000 for a loan, and you didn't have that £10,000, then you can borrow it from another member and they can earn interest. So you, can, so you can earn interest and you pay interest to other members, but not the bank. The bank just takes a fee. Okay? Does that make sense? So, so effectively, if effectively what you have is, is you get an interest-free mortgage from the bank itself, but in order to, to secure that, that mortgage, you, you need to pay a fee of 10%. That, that fee of 10% comes from their system, and if you don't have the 10%, you can borrow it from a member with, within the R system. And that's where members can actually earn um, interest on their money. I'll talk to you later. I'll explain it in greater detail if I miss it right. Go on. Well, I'm assuming that the money you're going to use will be pounds sterling? Yeah, um, we, we, we use pounds sterling initially and then we retire and we replace it with our own currency, which would be... Um, well, whether you call it sovereign pounds or give it another name, but yes, it's, it's, it's the equivalent of pounds sterling, but it would be, it would be a, a different in, in terms of its design. But it equates to, it has equal value. <laughs> Good question. Would there be any immunity? We all know that the euro's going to go down before long. Yeah. The pound will probably, well, the, the dollar definitely will follow it. Yeah. And the pound will follow it down the plug afterwards. Yeah, because it's, it's a debt-based currency. Ours is a, a positive liquidity. Everybody in our system will have, will have cash in the bank, right? So you, gotta, you ask the question, which system are they going to use? Are they going to use a system in which they owe money? Or are they going to use our system in which they got credit? So, so th there's going to be a natural transfer from their system to our system. It's not, it, it's not an action that happens on one day, it's a process. And that proce process happens when we've got enough people signed up to the lawful bank or to other banks, okay? So the question I've got is that if, if, if their pounds become worthless, yeah. does that mean that your pounds will become worthless? No, because, you, you, because everybody's going to need a means of exchange, yeah? And if you've got money in the bank, you've got something to exchange, okay? But if their system is based on debt and it collapses, there is no money. Okay, so you, you've got a negative situation You're with, with their... The system. Hey? You're selling the infrastructure. Yes, that's all, that's all it is. It's, yeah, exactly. Sir, so go on. Is it realistic to expect, if this is successful, which I believe it will be, that it will bankrupt the Bank of England um, I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think. Well, you know, there are certain areas which I don't really want to get into. The bottom line is that we're going to have a system in which everybody who's a member of our system is going to have a positive bank balance. Yeah, we're going to have positive liquidity. If their system fails, don't blame me. Okay? It's not my fault. I didn't set that system up. We're just talking about an alternative system that has benefits for the people. If they want to do something decent, how about them create their system that benefits the people and not greedy bankers, okay? Mm -hmm. Sir? Uh, yes, I'd like to clarify my name um, the last time you noted, just to clarify one of the points. First of all, this gentleman in front has actually answered one of the two questions that was asked. 
you will be adopting British sterling system currency to vote at the moment. Yes. So the, okay. yeah. the question, the main point of the question I was going to ask is, if you're going to set up a, a series of independent banks called the Royal Bank, would you not have to be come under the auspices of any regulatory body like the Financial Services Authority that would have to impose certain um, terms and conditions? In order to be, I would suggest, you would have to have, um, you should say, uh, a liquidity of money and assets which you've already acquired. The basic amount you could say stock pile of money with which you'd have to have as a minimum amount to make sure you can know you couldn't actually get the financial difficulties. Where would that money come from and why did they start? If I was to invest or deposit a hundred pounds and you say you'll be able to give back a thousand pounds, where would that thousand pounds come from initially? Uh, okay, the, this is why it's important to understand what money is. That with the, the, the point in time that we launch our bank is when we have the, the members, the critical mass of members, that can bring to the system the resources. Okay? Now, that's the first point. That's a very important point because we are expecting members to trade with each other using the currency that we create. The idea of bringing £100 from their system to our system is that will give us the initial cash flow which we can use in the shops, okay? So it gives us cash in, in, our, in our pockets. Now, their system has 3% of cash available. Our system will have 10%, yeah? So the £1,000 is positive liquidity. It's, 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 it's only... Its function is to allow us to exchange between us, okay? That, that's the important thing. So when you say, where does it come from? It literally is created from nothing in exactly the same way as they create money from nothing. Because the purpose of money is just to provide a mechanism by which we can start to trade with each other, yeah? So it's the resources that are important, not the money. The money has no real value. It's only the resources, yeah? And I, I, I do understand that this whole concept takes a bit of getting around to it. People say, where does the money come from? And when you say, well, it, it comes from, literally, you create it from nothing because it's only there to eat, to, to, to admit the, the, the trade of, of, of uh, resources. I'll give you an example. I mean, if I knit woolen sweaters, right, over the winter, I'd be selling them. But over the summer, I won't, okay? So during the summer, when I want to buy my lettuce, I'm going to be giving IOUs to people. So an IOU is money. So I'm going handing all these IOUs to these people to buy the letters, and come the winter when they want sweaters, they're going to be bringing me IOUs back, aren't they? And, and I'll be giving them the sweaters in exchange for the IOUs that I gave to them for the letters during the summer. So the money was created out for nothing, but because of the delay in, in, the, in the, our different commodities, I'm requiring to borrow money in the summer, and I get the cash flow back in the winter. So the money itself is not of any value, is it? What's of value is the letters and the sweaters. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Um, I was just going to say, like everyone here, I'm sure, can agree with like this uh, bank that you're talking about is beneficial for everybody. But uh, how, is, how easy is it to sign up to this group? Or um, the lawforbank.com, you just put your name on there. And, and that's the mechanism by which we communicate with you. That's the mechanism by which we sort of, we, 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 if you feed the, 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 the concept, how it works, etc. Because obviously it, it's, it, there's a lot of it, other issues attached to it. Um, I th was there, there, was a, there was a question, part of your question I didn't answer. I can't remember what it was now. But th there's so many different aspects of banking. And we've covered them all, but I may not explain them all tonight. But, but through, that, uh, through that website, you, you'll get the, the, the details uh, emailed to you. So that... You just literally sign up. It doesn't cost anything. If you established a court and you went into the um, Solitaire Act, uh, corrupt, yeah. and, uh, and, and operate uh, corrupt practices for finances, and you uh, explained the family courts are also operating yeah. under uh, uh, the secret uh, courts. Is there any court in this country that is uh, immune from uh, this? Uh, there are lots of good judges out there. Okay, that there are lots of good people working in the court system. It seems to me that they're taking out the smaller courts, and once they can get the court in the town, in the family court, and then go straight up to the high court, so they change things from the grassroots, yeah. so that they can eventually yeah. no, it's the jury. change the what they, the what they do, yeah. The yeah, the jury is a key thing, yeah. The thing at the moment is that if you take a small local court, and if you're dealing with the, um, the local authority, 
you're always going to get the system that work against you. You don't get fair hearings in the courts. Okay, that's the first thing. But if you're going in the court and you've got a, a, an issue with your neighbour, you, you'll get you'll get a fair hearing because th there's there's no interest in them being biased against one unless he's you know part of a club. And I'm not going to mention the club, but you know you know what I'm talking about. So so most of the system is actually that's in place. Most of the people working in the system actually think the system is good because they don't fully understand what's happening behind the scenes. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to re-educate these people to understand that the system, as far as councils are concerned, is corrupt, a corrupt as hell. And there are some people within the court system that are assisting that process. Whether they realize what they're doing or not, I don't know, I don't care. But once we've told them, once we've educated them as to what's going wrong, we expect them to change. And at the moment, that's what we're doing. With, with Norman Draper in, in Liverpool, uh, you know, I've explained to him that th these judges can't do this. These judges can't kick me out of my own hearing just because he doesn't like what I'm saying. I'm not, being I'm not going in there shouting at him. I'm not being rude to him. I'm in there with the rule of law, and the judge is using the rule of force. And we're saying you can't do that. And, and, and so we're slowly but surely getting the courts to change their, 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 their processes. You, we, How come they're allowing um, be, Because they're not strong enough. They're not, they're, they're, they are scared as well. Okay. Yeah, and the problem, they, they're looking after their pensions, and, and the bottom line is they are wait, they're waiting for us to do something. So it's all very well us saying to the good judges, why aren't you doing something? Because they're probably saying, well, why aren't you doing something? Mm -hmm. There are courts. The judges are supposed to be delivering justice to, to us, and they're not. So it's up to us to do something, and that's what these meetings are all about. We, we need to get off our bottoms, and actually, if we want to protect our constitution and the rule of law, that's what our job is. One nail you just hit on the head. We need to go. We might as well forget our enemies. Not the I agree. Uh, yeah. I, look, I'm absolutely 100% behind you, Steve. The bottom line is, I've said this for a long, long time, forget the members of parliament. They're useless, right? We do it ourselves. That's why we create alternative governance. That's why we stop paying the council tax. And anyone here, I mean, if, if you are paying your council tax, I suggest to you stop paying it. Go into the court. I'm, I'm happy to talk to people to tell you what you do. You take it as far as you need to do. You can keep them going for about you know, 12 months. If, if a million people were doing that, the system would come to a grinding halt. They, they are taking note of what we're saying. They're watching the videos, etc. I'll tell you an amusing little story because I, I wrote to the chief constable and complained about the three constables who, who threw me out of the court uh, to complain. And there was a knock on the door. And I opened the door and there was a policeman there. And I said, oh, hello. And I thought he was coming to, you know, to deal about this complaint. And he said, um, is, is it Mr. Hayes? I said, yeah. And he said, do you, do you drive a car? Blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah. He said, can I come in? I said, yeah. So, talking to him inside, sit down, like a cup of tea. Uh, no, no, thanks. He said, um, just had a complaint that uh, someone drove off from a petrol station without paying the petrol bill. <laughs> and I thought, all right. <laughs> when was that? And he gave me the date. And of course, what had happened is I just absolutely sort of drove, drove away. So I, I said, oh, I'll tell you what, um, can you take me down to the petrol station and we'll, we'll go and have a chat with the guy down there, which we did. And of course, um, I said, will you bring me back? And he said, yeah. And on the way down and on the way back, I had a very good conversation with this, this policeman. Um, the long and the short of it is the, the guy at the petrol station, I, I knew. I said, oh, obviously. He said, oh, I, I knew who you were, but I didn't know where you lived. So. So I paid him and, and uh, finished the conversation with the policeman. But I said to the policeman, uh, he, he said to me, are you the guy that was at that Birkenhead thing? And I said, yeah. I said, were you there? He said, oh, yeah, I was there. And I said, do you know what it was all about? And, and he said, yeah. I said, what was it about? He said, lawful rebellion. I said, do your other colleagues know what it's all about? He said, oh, they're all talking about it. Okay. So he was very friendly, very chatty, very nice. They're not all like that. Amongst the police, and I said, look, you guys, we want you guys on board. You know, we're not against the police, but we, we need you guys to understand what's going on. And clearly they're starting to, to wake up, aren't they? And if the police are talking about it, 
the courts are talking about it, who isn't talking about it? And, and remember this very important point, is that, that when we walk into the court, who are nervous? Who are the ones who are scared of who? We're not scared of the judges, they're scared of us. So this thing is moving ahead quite rapidly now. I recognise the time. All oh, right. <laughs> That's, yeah. Yeah. It's not my only tie. I do have another one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is important. In fact, can you get this on, on camera as well? Because I think this is important. The first constitutional conference on the 22nd of October is probably one of the most important conferences we're ever going to have. Okay? Because what we're going to reveal in the morning. Is, is vital to taking the message to the next level. So we are moving to the next level. We have spent two years finding out what it's all about. We have now got the proof, we have got the evidence, and we're going to expose it, okay? That means that the members of parliament, the judges, and the chief uh, police constables are not going to be able to deny anything. And then we're going to say to them, what are you going to do about it? We're going to um, issue a declaration which is a challenge for them to join us or end up in prison, okay? And then we're following that through with the conference on the 5th of, of uh, November, and, and that conference is, we've, we've told you what the problem is, we've proven to you what the problem is, now you can't say that you don't know. Now get yourself to the conference on the 5th of November and demonstrate to the people that you are on our side. That's the point, if you're going to be on our side. Fantastic. We will issue amnesties for all those people. And if they're not going to be on the people's side, then we're going to put them in prison. Okay? okay. Enough said.